Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on the 13th of February. Now, the uh, saga regarding the naming of the former Edinburgh Castle Cafe as the Redcoat Cafe has rumbled on and is still in the press today. But there's some interesting background information that has come to light through various sources online recently. One or two of them uh, are viewers of this programme and have pointed out one or two interesting things about the Edinburgh Castle Cafe. One of those things was that until very, very recently, the Edinburgh Castle Cafe was called simply that, the Castle Cafe. So the decision to change the name from something which is basically completely politically neutral to something deeply insulting to many Scots was actually taken very, very recently. And you can only conclude that the reason for the name change, although it has been, I suppose, slightly counterbalanced um, by the function suite name, but generally speaking, I think uh, the Castle Cafe's owners have made a tremendous blunder here. The backlash caused by this is probably going to lead to a mass boycott of that particular site. Even visitors from further afield will be aware of the controversy surrounding the naming of this cafe. Now, it might seem a trivial thing to anyone from outside of Scotland, but it would be a little bit like uh, a cafe, let's say, in the Tower of London being named after the Vikings, or perhaps being called the Adolf Hitler, or something like that. It would be a deep insult. And calling this uh, cafe after the Redcoats, who the Redcoats, as we all know, and it doesn't matter what all the various Unionist historians say about Scottish regiments wearing red jackets, the actual Redcoats themselves, they called themselves the Redcoats. They were known as a brutal and uh, ruthless uh, military force, which was used to basically pummel the Highlanders into submission. And after the slaughter at Culloden, where the Redcoats basically massacred the Highlanders who were outgunned and outnumbered in every respect, basically shot them to pieces with cannons, and it was a case of claymores versus cannons and muskets, the, the memory of this has not gone away, and people in Scotland do remember what a red coat is, and the fact that some Scottish regiments did wear red coats, um, one in particular before the Acts of Union and one after, it doesn't alter the fact that a red coat is an English soldier, and naming a a Scottish iconic castle cafe after something as brutal as that is a gross insult to everybody. I can only conclude that this was a deliberate act to politicise the cafe and made by somebody who perhaps thought that they could get away with it. However, it's not going to sit well with anybody and I guarantee you that that Red Coat Cafe, as long as that name remains, will remain empty of all Scots until something is done about it. And not only that, there will be probably people who feel strongly enough to stand outside and picket it, and just to remind any visitors from abroad that this is not just a, a name. This has some deep uh, meaning for many Scots. <coughs> However, moving along, um, there's been also a, a ramy over the exclusion of Scottish Curling Championships from the BBC Scotland. Now, looking deeper into this, um, that there's a number of things going on in the background. The first thing is that I think we all assumed that BBC Scotland Sport was the one responsible for axing uh, the live coverage of the Curling Championships from Scotland. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. <clears throat> in fact, BBC Scotland seems to have referred the decision to BBC Sport, who are based in Salford in Manchester. And it was they, and not BBC Scotland, who decided to cut Scottish curling from the live sports coverage to Scotland. <clears throat> so this is yet another English decision taken in England to prevent Scots from seeing what is effectively one of their major national sports. Now, on top of that, another change has occurred in the background in Scottish curling. And apparently, the parent organisation of Scottish curling uh, has had a rule change, which has permitted uh, a representative of the British curling team, uh, in inverted commas, to sit on the board which decides what Scottish curling does in the future. Now, this looks like it is going to herald a power grab of some sort. Now, when I say a power grab, having somebody from British curling, and do remember that 90% 
of the British curling team which will be chosen to go to the Olympic Games will come from Scotland because there aren't very many curlers in England and what little there are um, do not feature very high in the rankings. However, the Scottish uh, curling team is at the top of their game in terms of world championships and potentially the Olympic Games. So this looks like not only shutting off all views of our own sport to our own population, but the subtle change of uh, name again by an English organisation to the British curling team, so no mention of Scotland, no salt tyres, um, they'll be competing under a union flag at the next Olympic Games. Again, another snub, another very deliberate politicisation of something which is non-political, it's a sport. If this were Scottish football, it would be a different matter because Scottish football has a separate league system from England. Many people think that we should play as part of a British league uh, in terms of football. Team unable to get out of port uh, in England. Uh, sorry, due to, first of all, a, a problem with the propeller shaft uh, couplings on the Queen Elizabeth and uh, its sister or brothership, which I wrongly called the Duke of Edinburgh because I was confusing it with the name Prince of Wales. Uh, so the Prince of Wales, which is basically now is, I suppose, King Charles, they maybe should rename it, also seems to be having problems getting ready for sea. And this cringe fest that we're forced to undergo, where we basically are cringing in embarrassment at the United Kingdom's military's lack of technical competence to actually get a ship to sea, even for an exercise, has led to calls for some reorganisation of the British military's general sort of plan for the future. But I noticed also an article in the press today reminding us that there are six nuclear submarine hulks rusting away, sitting at anchor basically in Rosyth Harbour, whilst the British military is unable to come up with any safe way of disposing of the remaining nuclear material from the cores of these nuclear powered submarines. Again, it's Another one of these stories where Scotland is used as a dumping ground for British nuclear toxic waste. And I would imagine that no matter what our protests and no matter what is decided, that eventually some kind of nuclear waste repository will end up being in Scotland because this is where historically the British Ministry of Defence has dumped all its poison gas, its anthrax, it has polluted islands, it has dumped thousands of tons of unexploded ammunition into the seabed just off the west coast of Scotland and it generally treats us as a huge bin. So I think the underlying theme of this programme today is not so much good news but just pure anger, righteous anger at that and Scotland being ignored, made invisible in the sports field, having things blocked, having British historical names applied to Scottish historical sites and generally an attempt being made to force us to become British whether we like it or not. And this is a refrain which we have lived with for many, many decades if not centuries. Now to conclude the programme I noticed something also in social media today and it was a map of Europe including the British Isles and it was a map of Europe which showed the Japanese attitudes to each individual country in Europe, including those on the British Isles. And in each one, there was a single word. So, for example, in Belgium, it just said chocolate. Um, in Spain, it said football. Um, in Switzerland, it said clocks. When it came to England and Scotland, well, England was described in, this, in two words, actually, bad food. Scotland was described as once independence. Now, I think if the Japanese can see it, why can't we see it? The Japanese tourists travel all over Europe and they form opinions about different places, but it seems very obvious to them that Scotland wants independence. The question is, why don't the rest of the Scots actually see that as well? Anyway, that's it for me today, a slightly short version of IndyCar today, but just to remind you of the kind of nonsense that's going on at the moment with the BBC, with the sports world, and sort of just generally the the union flag wrapped nonsense that we're getting in all directions at the moment, bombarded from all sides. And I can tell you that IndyCar is being spammed by dozens of fake 
unionist bot accounts at the moment. I, I had a block festival this morning actually blocking a good few of them claiming all sorts of historical knowledge about redcoats and all the rest of it. But the fact of the matter is that naming a cafe the Red Coat Cafe in Scotland's capital is a deliberate insult. And I don't think you can take it in any other way. And having your one of your national sports curling blacked out by the country next door's television station is another gross insult. And then having the temerity to insert one of your own British curling team members onto the board of the Scottish Curling Association, or whatever it's called, is yet another attempt to Britify the sport. And this creeping Britification is going to keep going until we, as Scots, do something about it. And that needs to happen pretty soon. And our politicians seem to be absolutely terrified of doing anything about it. In fact, the SNP was characterised by a political commentator as being terrified of failure and Labour in Scotland being terrified of success. In other words, unable to commit itself to the kinds of things it's actually been saying um, in its um, manifesto pledges. I think they're terrified of appearing too Tory, but at the same time wanting power. So it's a difficult time for politicians, but who cares about politicians? It's time they manned up, womaned up, grew a backbone, and actually started doing what the Japanese think we should be doing, and that's getting our independence. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye for now.